Good evening. Appreciate you being here tonight. We'll keep our focus on things that are related to a gospel meeting that's coming up, and it has given us opportunity to keep our attention uh, fixed on why we're here and what our purpose is. That uh, gospel meeting is an annual event that kind of allows us to focus maybe a little bit more on reaching out, trying to interest people, expose people to a different voice, although the same gospel, because that never changes, but to bring them uh, into a focus where perhaps they will hear something that uh, will cause them to think and make some radical decisions maybe in their own life. And so I want to keep the focus there tonight in Matthew 28 and 18 through 20. Of course, Matthew's uh, account of the Great Commission, and it's where the Lord said to his own, and he says to us, that all power, that is all authority, has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them into the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the world. I know that tonight it's not going to be a radical view to look at the Great Commission again. It's not going to be anything earth-shaking as far as you're concerned to think about the things that are said by Jesus in that commission. And I've always heard that there are four commands given. The first one, go. The second, make disciples. The third, baptizing. And the fourth, teaching. Now again, it's not earth-shaking in any sense for you to contemplate each of those four statements. Maybe just a little reminder. The word go. Some have said that the sense there is as you go. That is, as you go about your business, whether it's work or school, whatever it is, as you go, be evangelistic. Well, it might be that it involves just a little bit more than that, because these apostles would travel, and so they would go into all the world. And Jesus said after that, make disciples. In your going, when you encounter people, make disciples of them. And in order to make disciples of people, that will involve a number of things. It will involve your connecting with them, knowing them, talking to them, being persuasive to some degree in your talking in order to make disciples. Now, I've always heard that that word disciple means learner, and it does, but there's more to it than just being a learner because you can learn about anybody 
and anything, and that doesn't mean that you are a disciple of the person that you may learn about. I, I read books all the time about different people. I don't disciple them. I read books that are written by lots of people, but I don't disciple them. I may learn from them, but that doesn't make me a disciple of them. So discipling involves more than just learning. There's following that's involved with that. So go make disciples, baptizing them. All right. So if you've made a disciple of someone, the easiest thing in the world for them, at least I would think, would be to want to be baptized. Shouldn't be a difficult step at all. Once they understand what the gospel is, sin in their life that needs to be forgiven, and just how easy it is to accomplish that reality in obeying Jesus should be a very easy thing for people to want to be baptized. They won't argue about it. They won't debate the matter. They'll, they're ready to do it, hopefully. Baptizing them in the name of Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And then teaching them. As we pointed out this morning, there has to be some grounding and that grounding is well explained in, in Ephesians, the third chapter, rooted and grounded in love. And <clears throat> that takes time. It takes an effort. It may take years of your life. In fact, you never really complete it. But there's teaching that has to go on. We don't dip them and leave them. We want them to learn and grow and develop in the life of being a Christian, as we all do. And so that, again, is the, the Great Commission. Now, Gospel meeting coming up begins in just a few days. Great Commission is in our minds. Eddie Clower will do an outstanding job, as you know. Eddie was here in 1985 for a Gospel meeting. Some of you may remember that. But we know him because he comes here every year and speaks on behalf of uh, his work with Truth for Today and his mission school. And we support that. And so we know him as a result of it. He's no stranger here. But he will do an outstanding job. There's no question, no doubt whatsoever. And you have and will do whatever's within your power to get the word out to people about what will transpire here. Some have gone door knocking. Some have used the door hangers that we have and put them on people's doors. You can hand out the best of printed materials and nobody does it better than Horton and Horton Printing. And you can give it out till it's all gone. And all of that will have some effect on people. Some may look at it and just toss it in the waste can. Others may look at it and think about it. Oh, I, I, I know Eddie Clower. I went to Harding. Not me, I'm, I'm, I'm just envisioning how a person might react. I went to Harding, I remember Eddie Clower, he was a teacher there. I think I'll go and hear what he has to say. So all of that is evangelistic. It, we pray will have some effect with people, but you know and I know that the most important element in evangelism is you. More people will be reached 
by somebody that they know than by any other effort that you might put forth. All of it good, and we pray effective. But by and large, for the most part, people will come here, people will be affected and hopefully taught and brought to Jesus because of someone that they know. Now, door knocking's good, handing out materials good, but the most important thing is that they know you. And that will go a great deal farther than anything else that we can do. We pray, we invite, we might drive people, bring them here. We have to be evangelistic here because if I'm not evangelistic here, why should I go somewhere else? Why should I go to Mexico with Wayne? Why should I go to California or Texas or wherever if I'm not evangelistic here? It begins at home. And it begins with people that you know. Now, I want to take that particular thought and I want to develop that just a little bit. I don't know if that will provide just a slightly different tweak to the Great Commission or not. It's not my job to change it. I'm not changing it. But I'm trying to remind us that, you know, the most important element in all of this is Jesus. It's the gospel. And that will be more powerful in people's lives because they know me and you. And, uh, and that will help more than you'll ever give it credit. I'd like for us to think in terms of the New Testament teaching us about evangelism because people were prepared for it ahead of time. Jesus, who taught us to be evangelistic, was himself evangelistic. We might even look at Jesus as the first evangelist because in his own teaching of his disciples and consequently us, he used a parable one time. Well, he used many. But this parable was about scattering seed and planting that seed. And you know it, of course, the parable of the sower in Matthew chapter 13. And in those days, in those ways, the sower just threw it everywhere. And it fell different places. Consequently, it had different success depending on where it fell. That's people. That's life. That's the way the gospel works. But the parable itself is, is intriguing because of the different soils that are described here and the different hearts that people have. That's the lesson that we take home from it. And as Jesus explains the parable, it's elementary, I mean... The first ground is the wayside, and that's where seed was received. Well, almost received anyway, because it was there that the wicked one came along and snatched it away, whatever was sown in the person's heart, and it really didn't do any good. The second ground, of course, stony places, where somebody hears the gospel and boy it sounds good and they're on fire for that but the, it doesn't have any root you see it doesn't go anywhere and it lasts for a little while and then trouble follows 
they have some problems, consequently they fall away. A lot of people like that, you've known many. Again, seed was received among thorns, and that's where different cares and pleasures of life enter in and squeeze out whatever success the seed of the gospel might have had in a person's life, and the love for money and pleasure takes over. And again, they go nowhere, and then there's the good ground, and it brings forth plentifully in different degrees and different amounts. You know that, but you know, farmers know where to sow the seed to be most effective. That's the way farmers are. They prepare the ground, they fertilize the soil, they get everything ready, and then they plant, and they expect to have good success. And farmers prepare things that way, and, and we do the same. Uh, we do the same because we, you know, we prepare hearts and we go certain places with certain people where you're going to be most effective. And Jesus was that way too, you know. It's very difficult for us to remember and really to comprehend that Jesus had to remind people that he was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. And there were times when he had to remind people of that fact. Like, for example, in Matthew 15 and verse 24. I really don't have the time or shouldn't take the time to get into the context of it, but it's a very fascinating account of a woman needing help in Matthew 15 and appealing to Jesus, and the disciples are put out with her because she's so vehement about it, and they want to get rid of her because she keeps crying after them. She's a mother who has a daughter who's severely demon-possessed, and she appeals to Jesus, and you know how mothers are. They're not silent when their daughters or children are in danger. And she appeals to Jesus for help, and Jesus says nothing, not a word to her. And that's hard for us to figure that out. And then he says to her, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel, to a select group of people. But she kept on. Lord, help me. It's not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. Those of you in my Wednesday night class, which is most of you, Matthew 7 and verse 6, we'll be dealing with that. Don't cast your pearls before swine and your bread before dogs, Jesus said. Why? This is an example of what he meant by that. This was not his job, but she persisted. And she said, yes, Lord, but even the little dogs can eat the crumbs that fall from your table. And now he complimented her. Oh, woman, your faith is great. Let it be as you desire. Jesus was not sent to her race, only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's, the lim that's what we call the limited commission. It's hard for us to understand that because our commission is the great commission to go into all the world, preach the gospel to every creature, not a select group. That was Jesus' job. But he gives us a different one. And so for us, the sower, the ground is picked, the ground is prepared. You know who can be easily reached and who can be appealed to. 
that might bring forth the greatest results. That's what Jesus did, and that's what Jesus taught. Make disciples, he said. There were some that wanted to follow him, and he wouldn't allow it. In Matthew 8, and verses 19 and 20, there was someone who came to Jesus and said, I'll follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said, the foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, the Son of Man has nowhere to lay his head. Why did Jesus say that? I don't know, unless it was to get the person to think about what he was about to get into, because Jesus was an itinerant preacher. He traveled. He went everywhere. There was nowhere to call home. And he said, okay, if that's what you want, you better be aware. Go into this with your eyes open, because that's what's ahead of you. You think about that. Didn't, Jesus didn't say, yeah, just jump right on. Come on board. No, he said, you, you better think about what you're getting into. He's, he's preparing the ground, you see, the good ground. That's what he wants. You want to, you, you can make a prospect list. And that prospect list should include those people that you think you can reach. I'm not excluding people, but you prepare the ground. Why? Because more people will come to Christ through those that they know than by any other way. And then we pursue the New Testament and we peruse it and we watch in the book of Acts just how phenomenally the church grew and how it started out. 3,000 baptized after hearing one sermon. And you say, well, why can't we duplicate that today? Well, think about it for just a moment. Those 3,000 people were prepared before they ever heard Peter preach that first gospel sermon. These were Jews who were taught. They were religious. They had good upbringing. They made some radically serious mistakes, yes. And when they heard Peter preach that first gospel sermon, they saw where they stood and they knew what they needed to do. Or at least they asked, men and brethren, what shall we do? And there it took off. It wasn't that they were, that they knew nothing. They were prepared before Peter ever stood up to preach. And as you go through the book of Acts, you know it's not all that different with others. For example, the Ethiopian eunuch, Philip was sent to him, and these two people got together, Philip and the Ethiopian, coming from different directions, and the Spirit sending Philip until you get to this man, a eunuch, in Acts chapter 8, selected. Did, he come in, did the Ethiopian come into it blind and absolutely ignorant? No, he's reading out of the book of Isaiah. And he had some questions. Who's Isaiah speaking of? Is it the prophet or some other man? Philip helped him out. Acts chapter 10, Cornelius. The gospel finally goes to the Gentiles. Open and the door is wide open through Cornelius. But you know what? Cornelius, he wasn't just somebody off the street. He was devout. He was prayerful. He gave. He studied. He knew he didn't have Christ. But I've never read a commentary on Cornelius or ever heard a preacher preach on him who didn't say, you know what? Cornelius would put most of us to shame. He was that kind of a man. When Paul preached and he went everywhere preaching just like the other apostles did, the first thing that he did 
when he entered a town, was to go into a synagogue, a Jewish synagogue. Why? Because these were people who were prepared ground. They knew their Bible. And that's the first thing that he did, was go into the synagogue. Acts chapter 17, verses 2 and 3. When he went into the Athens, Greece, he went to the synagogue, and he, went in, he stayed there three weeks preaching to those people opening and alleging that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Opening what? Their Old Testament. And when Paul worked with Barnabas, what did they do? Well, they went back over places where Paul had been previously and preached the gospel and established congregations and in Acts chapters 15 and 16, they went back over those places, back to those same congregations, revisiting those brethren. Why? Because you're helping those who heard the gospel the first time. And going back and revisiting places where they have been before. Very few people ever respond positively to the gospel upon the first hearing. Did you? Did it take a while to get to you? How many sermons did you hear before you were baptized? Who had to work on you over a period of time before you obeyed the gospel? Very few people. I'm not saying some don't, but few. Obey it the first time. And it's like I indicated this morning. Those of you who like to fish, and that's a lot of you, fish don't always bite the first time. And there are various reasons for that. I don't fish, but there are various reasons for, for that. But you keep trying, and eventually they take it, hopefully. And in 1 Peter 3 and verse 1, Peter had something to say to Christian women whose husbands were not in Christ. And he said to them, you know what? You watch your behavior. You work on him through your life and through your actions. And it may take a while. And there are no promises, no guarantees. But you work on him through your demeanor as well as the word, but don't preach at him, but live a faithful Christian life before him. And that was, that's from Peter to women whose husbands are not Christians. And I'd love to be able to say, you know what, that's going to get it for you and that's going to do it every time. It doesn't always do it. But it's your role because you're working on that ground, you see, that prepared ground. And it's a commitment. And again, using the fishing line once more, they don't always take it the first time, so you keep trying. You try another time, and you try a different angle, and you try a different preacher, and we bring in somebody as gifted as Eddie Clower. And we let him try. And he'll toss that bait out there. Same bait. Different fishermen. And maybe, maybe, it will work. What constitutes fishing? What constitutes evangelism? What constitutes your hands being free of the blood of all men? because you love souls and you'll take the efforts that are available to you and you'll try to reach them with the gospel of Christ. It's a life commitment as we pointed out this morning. It involves life. It involves being connected to the true vine, Jesus. It's abiding in Jesus. That's why you're here tonight and we have a pretty good Sunday night crowd. That's abiding in Jesus, and this is evidence of it. And it takes that to be able to reach people 
with the gospel. Evangelism is a life commitment. It's not, well, it's the time of the year, we're having a gospel meeting, it's time to think about it. No, it's a life commitment. You're never off. You don't ever have any, you don't have any vacation time. You don't. It's always, your eyes are open and your heart is in tune with the needs of people to hear the gospel of Christ. <clears throat> That's what it means to make disciples. It's going after those that know you and that trust you. And maybe that's a good place for us to uh, conclude. If somebody were to shadow you for a little while, if they were to go home with you, if they were to follow you at work, follow you at home, watch you, what would they see in you? Would they see in you a person who has been with Jesus? I'm reminded in Acts 4.13, Peter and John, among those who oppressed them the most severely, put the pressure on them not to be preaching the way they had in, in the third chapter and the early part of the fourth chapter of the book of Acts. But as they watched Peter and John, realizing that, hey, they're just ignorant guys. They're not well-educated and all that. But they took no knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. Would anybody think that of you? We won't make disciples until they do. Not going to have that touch until they do. Make disciples. Trying to focus in and I've gone too long. And I know it. You know it. I know it. Make disciples. That's a job. It's a great job, isn't it? Somebody made you one. Your job to make somebody else. Bring them to Jesus. Tonight as we think about these things and we sing this song to encourage you, if you need to come to Jesus, please do while we stand and sing.